we were saying earlier that we're both uh, uh, we're both sort of uh, people who are not from Ottawa but live here. But I guess the town has kind of uh, adopted you now. Yeah, you know, if you hire enough people, you actually become super welcome. <laughs> I found Smith Falls really loves me. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, the, you know, there's a there's a long career to talk about, but I want to start by talking uh, about bad ideas. Um, because uh, back in 2013, uh, when you uh, went into that building in, in Smith's Falls uh, and started, uh, you know, uh, a, a cannabis company, um, you, you've said it was one of the worst ideas in the history of business ideas at the time. So what's, what's so good about a bad idea? Well, actually, I don't know who was here last night, but I, I liked the configuration uh, when they were doing the, uh, the fucked up discussion where there was like two chairs and there was a bench in between, because I said if I got to go there, I was going to lay on the bench and just unload everything. Um, that probably would, if we had that, I would be laying on the bench right now. So um, in terms of bad idea, the definition of a bad idea is when most people don't like it. They don't think it's a good idea. And I think that actually by default can almost be the first indication it's a place you should invest, because when there's a, a disconnect on public information and public perception. It could be historic bias, um, could be a variety of reasons, but you don't want to put all your time into something that's already a super good idea and everybody's doing. And so um, that may sound weird and it's not trying to be like um, a contrarian. It's actually saying like if I drive around and think about something and I talk to myself, which I do, I encourage other people in their cars when no one else is there to talk to yourself. Um, if you keep thinking something through and you keep concluding it's a good idea, you go out and do it. Um, but in 2012, when I was starting uh, Tweed then, the first four people I asked if they would like to be involved with me all said no. This is a very bad idea. I said, well, why? Well, some of them said, you know, reputationally. You have a reputation as a tech person, as an entrepreneur, you've done fine. If you go into that space, it's going to look very bad on you. Okay. Uh, my brother's view was that um, bikers grew all the weed and they would kill me. I said, that makes it a bad idea. So, okay, I get where you're coming from on that one. Um, but I spent six to 12 months where it was a bad idea and almost anybody who was willing to join me, I hired them, which is a fairly bad idea in itself. Like if your criteria for who you hire to help you in a business is anybody who will join, um, that is not a great filter. And so, you know... I mean, these it's not much of a filter at all. Well, um... Suppose you're a super smart PhD chemist and you went to all the right schools and in 2013 you join a pot company. That would look like a very career limiting move. And so I, I was a bad enough idea that it was probably three years before we could actually hire people who were academically suited to do the research and they wouldn't even join the primary company. What I had to do was set up a company to the side fund it with separate people and make sure the intellectual property stayed in that company and could only be used under license by Canopy in order to attract um, physicians, chemists, researchers. They did not want to join the bad idea big pot company. So I, I think bad ideas, you know, uh, I'm not of the view that just because I have sloppy handwriting and all doctors have sloppy handwriting that I'm a doctor. Like I don't, I don't sign to that logic. Um, and so not all bad ideas are ultimately good ideas, but um, I think persistence against ones which you can find the logic to hang it together. And my logic was a lot of people like weed. If the government's going to govern it and they actually are principally worried about you not losing it, chain of custody is a big deal. Uh, most of the people who knew a ton about weed did not really know very much about chain of custody. And so you start to have an information positioning advantage. I did not pay him to say the word logic a few times in that sentence. Just want you all to know. Um, so let's talk about what then started happening. So you set up Canopy Rivers. You start doing uh, more research and development. Uh, let's talk about diversification for a bit. So you start out in the medical marijuana business, and you know by the time uh, you're done at Canopy, you're making you know deals with Martha Stewart to do CBD for pets. Um, and I bring that up like not really. Honestly, not to make fun of it, but but the idea of uh, you know you went after IP, you went after um, moving into sort of lateral spaces uh, when you could have you know just been fine making a lot of money in the cannabis business. What? Why diversify? Why take those risks? And I should thank you people for being here because um, 
if you think about it, this is the last session. Everyone who speaks American has left because they have Thanksgiving tomorrow. Um, so I, I, it is very nice of you to actually be here because I'm not sure I would be. So um, thank you. Um, so why diversify? Uh, if you don't have a business plan for growth, you have a business plan for death. And so when I looked at everything, every time there's a good opportunity, the way I perceive business is uh, I picture you're swinging on a vine and the key thing is to know when to grab the next one and let go of the last one. Otherwise you start going backwards. And there's a lot more risk of hanging on to the vine too long than there is trying to grab the next one. Because I would sooner fall and splat dead than die slowly swinging backwards. And so if you perceive it that way, you're going to always look for diversification and you're going to start to continuously challenge yourself and the company to perceive the opportunity of what's next. And if you take it all the way through, I see a number of, I'm not judging you, but I see a number of bottles of water on the desk. If you were to make that bottle of water into a terrific tweed drink, which were some of them were announced today, um, instead of focusing on growing cannabis and focusing on making a $50 million bottling plant, that beverage uh, will have about 2 to 2.5 milligrams of THC in it. Current prices call it 10 cents of active ingredients. It will sell for, say, 3 bucks. If you put the right brand and the right products together, there's a lot more margin. And so it's always about how are you moving forward, how are you taking R&D and turning it into productized outcomes, which people will stand in line to buy. And so um, when I think about the weed space, that was a chapter. When I think about what we try to do with Rock of Fire Batter, it's always about how can we make people change their behavior and adopt. And typically that's about something new which gives them an outcome that they couldn't get through any other method. And how do you manage that, those transitions? So, you know, you've, you've had, you have a bunch of different companies that you have run, that you have helped grow. Um, at each stage of that growth, how do you manage getting the people that got you there to the next stage? How do you manage, you know, you're diversifying a company, you're bringing in subject matter experts who uh, don't necessarily know the same things that the people you have there do. How do you manage those relationships? I think it... Um so I, I hate giving people annual reviews, and I don't remember ever getting one. So I think um, that whole process of managing people, I don't like. Um, what I would sooner do is focus everybody, and as you get older, you get more into it. What is the outcome we're trying to create? And if you really focus and manage the outcomes, it's amazing how motivational it is for everybody to actually achieve them. And so I found that we never had to actually do a transition, because from day one, we're always trying to manage outcomes. The type of outcome changes. You know, you want to create this type of infrastructure. Now you want to create this type of product. You want to follow this methodology for approval through a medical clinical trial. But the outcome is we want to be able to tell folks, um, your grandparents are going to be in a long-term care facility. Part of the reason they may act a bit weird when they get there is they take so many drugs, their brain gets this fuzziness from drug-on-drug -drug interaction. So the goal would be to say, how can we look after elderly people using cannabis because they have four principal problems? Typically, they get anxious, they don't sleep very well, they move kind of poorly, and um, you know their appetite can be crappy. But if you can actually manage an outcome where all those bad drugs go away, grandma and grandpa's brain actually works much better, um, that's a good outcome. Okay, I have no clue how to do that. Please, smart people, go do that. And the effect is, the next thing you're running clinical trials and you're disrupting pharmaceutical companies, and all you really wanted was old people not to be kind of dozy because they're taking too many drugs. So that, I find, is much easier to manage than to say, could you follow my exact lead on how I want the molecules put together? That would not turn out super well. And, and I want to pick up on, some, on the way that you were talking about that, because we discussed this a little bit earlier. You're focused on outcomes, not problem solving. Uh, explain to the rest of them that didn't have that call why that is. Um, okay. Uh, we're in Canada, and even in America, people continuously talk recently about CBD and THC. Those are active ingredients in cannabis. Um, it is my view that people very seldom line up to buy ingredients. Like we've never had a you know, really big fight in our house about the brand of white sugar that someone purchased. Um, what we care about is what you create with these things. And so um, when we look at these sort of, uh, these worldly opportunities, it's, it's always about turning it into something that people desire rather than talking about the inputs to the output. And so the whole world of, I don't care if it's building software, what is the problem you solve is more important than how many lines of code. 
Um, when you're trying to make a product in the cannabis space, it's not what's in it, it's what you get out of it. And so we spend a lot of time debating the merit of a particular, me walking around an empty building six years later, it had 4,500 employees in 16 countries. And uh, they sort of stitched together because the company today was awarded the best corporate culture in Canada for a particular substantial category by a pretty big authority. And it's because people were brought to a place where they were intended to work on things that they knew what the purpose was and they weren't able to get productive because they weren't micromanaged on how they achieved it just within regulations. So let's talk about how you got to those 16... And we're talking a lot more about weed than I thought we were going to talk about. Like I'm still... Um, part of the reason the company worked okay is because um, one of the rules I made when I started was no one is allowed to buy a server or a PBX. Everything has to be cloud hosted, which sounds kind of hilarious. Like you're a marijuana company that creates clouds. No, we work in the cloud. Um, but the whole point of it was scalability. And when you're trying to do things that are about maintaining control and chain of custody, what you don't want is to have um, tethered systems. And so everything in the place from day one was all about scalability, which is how you can actually go the way we did. And a number of the other players went old school, and the effect was that they stayed in a single site, maybe two, scaled poorly, had compliance problems, uh, had ambition, but they could not follow through. And so I would say it was basically a tech company that grew weed. Let's talk about some of the uh, some of your tech companies. Uh, you're wearing a couple of them uh, today, yep. uh, Martello and Rockify. Um, so, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, regu regulation on the border uh, because uh, you know cannabis is a highly regulated space where you're allowed to play. What you're allowed to do is fairly limited. SaaS companies not usually the case. Right. Um, what uh, what holds companies back from making those leaps and getting into those 16 countries? Well, it's um, who's from Canada, right? I, I, I've used it, overused it. I say that Canada is a great place to be from. But if you just want to stay here, it's not great. So um, from day one, everything I've ever done, you try to say, how do we start here and get out of here? But don't leave, just scale out of here. So um, it still comes back to it. Like um, Martello, I think we have uh, customers in over 100 countries now. The first tech company I co-founded, uh, we did more business with Chevron Nigeria for the first five years than we did in all of Canada. But we have a definition of a problem we solved that just took longer to get adopted in Canada. And so when I think about things, so um, maybe I'll give a quick example. Martello um, tries to make terrific applications like Office 365 and Skype for Business tolerable. And the way that we do that is uh, a bunch of monitoring and applications that really you know, bring the quality through in terms of bandwidth. And we do it so you just, you know, um, go to major corporations who have global businesses because bandwidth problems are a lot bigger deal when you're trying to deal as Volkswagen or the United Nations across a global fabric than they are if you're just dealing with a business in Ottawa. So by default, they become international. That's our best customer. Uh, Rockify will be international, but it starts locally. And, you know, now it's two countries, Canada and the U.S. And what it's trying to do is, it's sort of back to my original purpose, which is people want to buy an outcome. And when we started Ruckify, the outcome we wanted was access to equipment that wasn't in my garage that I needed right away, that I didn't want to have to go and rent at some stupid rental shop because they may not have had what I wanted. But when we focused on the problem, great, we found a way to solve it, get inventory and build it up. The more you think about it, and often you'll start a business for one reason, and if you're open, you'll change a lot about it. On that one, the reason I want Ruckify to work is I feel really guilty. Um, and many of you should, and probably a lot of your parents. I own tons of things that are principally based on digging big holes to take out ferrous materials, then drilling a hole to get some hydrocarbons, using some facilities probably in China to turn those ferrous materials and hydrocarbons into something like, say, a power washer, putting it into a box surrounded by styrofoam, wrapping it in plastic, shipping it across the ocean, getting it to a store in Ottawa. I buy it, unwrap it, put it in my garage, use it for once a year for about eight minutes. That is like gluttonous, wasteful consumption um, versus me having it and sharing it. Um, because if I use it for eight, maybe 10 minutes a year, why not ruckify it and we can all share it, especially if it's insured, because what I don't want is you to wreck my power washer and me not to get a new one, but I also don't want you to get hurt and that to become my problem. And so if that started off as I just needed a better chainsaw to fix a problem, but what it really turned into is a perception on our part, which is, you know, it's good you use Uber and Lyft. Um, 
that's probably better than making a whole bunch of extra cars. You know, Airbnb is nice, but if you think about the total impact on the environment, all the things that people accumulate in their house, like anyone who has any of these kitchen, we have a lot of kitchen equipment. We even use some of it at least once a year, like mix masters and all these blenders and things. There are so many things that you could throw into a Lyft and an Uber. On a short-term shuttle there at your house, you use it for the two hours or one hour or 10 minutes that so you need it, and it's back to my place. And so that peer-to-peer -peer sharing, I actually think, if done properly and globalized, could be one of the most impactful environmental outcomes uh, that we could be involved with. And it all just started off because I was pissed off that my chainsaw wouldn't actually cut up the tree that had fallen over and because it was kind of not a good enough, big enough chainsaw. And so I give you that in that um, I have one of my companies that failed, like I mean super failed, the one that did the business with Chevron Nigeria. Uh, it was okay. The one that came after that, Microsoft bought the intellectual property and I made exactly zero dollars. Um, that is not a good outcome. But it failed because what we didn't do was look at what our customers were using the actual application for and how they're taking the data. We kept telling them what it was for and they were using it for other things and we didn't listen. The effect was we failed. Um, I have an instant pot that's sitting in a box that I bought. Instant pot, man. <laughs> the world needs 11 more of those every second. Um, I, should really, I should really start using it. Um, so uh, I want to talk, uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about getting bigger and how you get uh, the money to do it and uh, the people to do it. So let's start on the acquisition front. So um, all your companies are acquisitive. I don't know whether that's a word. Somebody look it up and tell me after. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's still a relatively unusual strategy for Canadian scale-ups. Why spend all that money? Um, well, just to give you context, uh, in the last six years, uh, Canopy did 31 acquisitions, Martello's done three, and Rockify just did one. And um, there's two things I'll tell you. Uh, if you make a mistake in buying a company, the most important thing to do is buy more companies. It's true. Because if you make a mistake and you stop, then the last thing you did was make a mistake. But if you blend together enough of them, you get really good at it. And before you know it, your mistake is embedded inside of a whole bunch of good acquisitions. So um, that was part of the strategy. And you know, I'm trying to be fairly transparent. But in Canopy, I did four terrible acquisitions. Your problem will be you have no clue which were the four because they were embedded inside 31. Um, in the case of how much it costs, so you said about scaling up. There's two things about scaling up. Um, you generally need to have a liquid stock or something that people believe in. Part of the way you get them to believe in it is put it on an exchange and have it trade actively or on your balance sheet have enough cash that you could pay cash for the acquisition. So then they say, well, you're good at getting cash. I will take your stock. Because if you're a private company buying a private company and you look like you're going to go bankrupt, you'd have to be an idiot to sell to the soon-to-be bankrupt company. And so one of the things we tried to do in both Martello and Ruckify is make sure we had substantial balance sheets. And people, I'm, I actually talked to many people at this event over the last day and a half, and there's a perception that there's a scarcity of money. I believe that is entirely untrue. I think there's almost unlimited capital, but it's smart. And it's only going to places which it understands. And when I watch the pitch fests, I like them both, but I could see where money would end up. They like larger markets. They like things that they say um, tease out a complexity or a nervousness, something that makes the consumer react. And so I've never found that there's actually a scarcity of capital if you package your opportunity and your solution correctly so that you're describing the outcome and the value per individual you implement the outcome for. And so um, I like buying things because it lets you go faster. So we just bought a, you know, if you need an RV in Western Canada, we bought the ability to have it. Why did we buy it? It's a really good category. And guess what? If you happen to be in the rental business of renting RVs, I rented one once. You know what I'm never doing? Renting one again. Um, I might buy one, but I'm not renting it again. And so the effect is that you get a bunch of people who use it once. So now in the Ruckify context, we can take that one-time user and turn them into a multi-repeat customer across many categories. We can take their experience with that and add on to it and give them all kinds of secondary equipment. Um, in the case of Martello, we bought three or four companies, and the reason we bought them is they're geographically dispersed or they have application spaces that are like Office 365, and we can jump ahead. Um, so, Rockify goes public next year. Yep. Uh, Martello went public. Oh, by the way, go public often and early. And I say that, and people say, oh my God, why would you do that? Well, I don't know, like, would you like to have the grand opportunity to have bought a ton of stock in WeWork just before it was supposed to go public at, what, three times its current valuation? Or things like Uber and 
you know, a lot of these companies get so much venture capital jammed into them. Picture a balloon getting as big as the balloon possibly could before it pops, and then they take it to the public markets and say, here you go, dummies, own it. Um, I don't like that model. What you should do is go public early, build value, and then all of a sudden everybody tells you about this great company. Oh my God, I bought some Ruckify stock and I'm way up and I love the application. And the next thing you know, you're using earned media, which believe it or not, still works. People who buy newspapers that are in a printed format actually have bank accounts with tons of money. There's a strong correlation, trust me. Um, and so what you do is when you go public, you use that as a platform to inform people the opportunity to use your product, make their stock go up, and tell everybody about it. And if you do that often enough and well enough, before you know it, you're actually successful because you listed, not listing because you're successful. Right. So, and and that and that's kind of what uh, I wanted to talk about because you know you you went public on the DSXV with uh, with Tweed, then Canopy. Uh, you did it with uh, you did it with Martello. Um, there there is some sort of hesitation around the more junior exchanges because it, you know like you're not up in the big time, but but you haven't felt any of that. Um, who knows the Toronto Stock Exchange venture? Who's heard of that? So typically at a mining convention, everybody's heard of it. Because at a mining convention, unlike you, you actually build software. At mining conventions, they don't mine. They, they actually don't actually have mines. What they do is they tell you if you gave them more money, they might dig a hole. And so the venture exchange allows you to list a company that doesn't actually do anything. It's not a bad thing, it's just a thing. And so I, I listed the first marijuana company in the history of the world on a public exchange. And this exchange, which has people that never dig holes to do the mining that they're getting the money for, didn't want me to be on their exchange. And they made it really super hard for me to be there. And they ultimately said, well, listen, we have to be very careful. We're worried about our reputation. Now, um, that is a very odd statement in my mind for a place that allows a bunch of people who largely get money to not dig holes. When I actually had a tangible business federally regulated, it was doing something. But nonetheless, you list. And I listed Martello and we'll list others. Some of them are better for U.S. exchanges. I think Ruckify will be better for a U.S. exchange because our customers are, you know, really... Um, if we target 50 cities, 43 of them will be U.S. based. But I like the idea of listing because, believe it or not, there are programs and reports and podcasts that every day have to generate new information about new ideas that are listed companies. And if you're willing to work your butt off, you can get in two to five times a week and work your game up. And, you know, so it was really cool working with Martha. But i got to say, you actually, uh, there's a show called Mad Money, and the guy who runs it's name is Kramer. Believe it or not, if you've ever seen the show, he's actually more calm on air than he is off. He is one of the most intense people on the planet. Um, but if you get on with him and you do a good job, they keep bringing you back, and the next thing you know, your stock's running up. And I give you that in that I think a lot of people are reluctant to actually go work with the media. And if you have a company, you should have a policy that no matter what, you always say yes to the media, 100% of the time. In fact, when I hired my first media person at Tweed, I said, listen, I need you to really understand what I mean. Like, in the event I accidentally commit a triple homicide, you still yes, say yes to the media. And um, we're going to do the interview because there's not a good day or a bad day you don't do media. You do it every day. And if you get used to that pattern, it goes super well. If you only want to cherry pick and give them the good days, guess what? They're going to pick on you and make good days not as good. And so if you think about being public as an inclusive activity that involves working media, attending and presenting, and actually trying to make this into a story that gets repeated enough times people adopt the product and the stock, you'll succeed. If you want to go public and hope it works out, I can tell you the answer, it won't. Please take notes about that media stuff. I want you all to call me. Um, I want to take one uh, He did ask, slide. he goes, you're not serious. Like, you don't think you can accidentally have a triple homicide, do you? <laughs> At least you're paying attention. Uh, I want to take this one from Cider because I think it's a uh, it's a good one. I is there an opportunity that was in its early stages that you initially said no to that you wish you could have been on? Board? Oh my God, Toby, come and sit down with me again. Wind back the time machine. Um, so I was at a breakfast event when some guy sitting to my right was describing with a bit of an accent something about snowboards and shit. And I was like, listen, I'm pretty busy. I'm not sure I even know what you're talking about. And we had a nice chat. And I think I was supposed to follow up. Damn, that could have been okay. Um, so yes, that, that one, um, I'm very attentive to all ideas now, and I like to understand them more fully than I invested in that one. So yeah, there, there's, um, there are so many ideas. I would say the thing that I probably now try to look at is, 
I was just on a phone call before I came in. There's a reasonably famous former hockey player, and they think they should be a big deal in a cannabis space. And they have all these ideas, but they're not willing to put their reputation or money on the line. And I'm not interested in people who have ideas. I'm interested in people who've actually put themselves in harm's way by taking their idea and turning it into something and actually rip risking what they have, and they're going to go all in. Um, I can get pretty excited about that. Uh, call me because you have an idea. Like, how about you activate it and suffer a bit, and then let's chat. So uh, I want to wrap up here by talking a little bit about relationships. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, you, you alluded to this earlier. In the early days of Tweed, there were some relatively high-profile departures. Um, you know, you uh, obviously cannot be ended um, after you brought in some, uh, some pretty big investors. Uh, but you've also got this really long-standing uh, relationship with Terry Matthews, uh, which uh, my takeaway from that is uh, always run for student government because you can end up on the board of Carleton University sitting next to uh, Terry Matthews. Um, how, do you, how do you think about the kinds of people that you want to work with given your experience? And how do you maintain those, like, how do you stay friends with and a partner with Terry Matthews for, you know, 20, 30 odd years? Well, um, so just to fill in the blanks for people, um, I took six years to do a four-year degree. And my parents routinely asked, will there be a graduation this year? And I had to explain to them, this is an education, not a race. You need to be more patient. Um, that worked for two more years. And um, the reason I did is I was a little bit interested in everything, which meant I got, if you could run for an office, which I wasn't political, I just liked all the trappings of political office. So for example, if you sat on the board of governors of a university, you got two perks. One is all board members had a parking spot for free. So like there's Jaguar and then there's my piece of shit falling apart car and then there's Jaguar. Um, but when you're on the board, you also got to eat in the faculty club for free for the entire month and you only had a problem at the end of the month, which was paying for all the shit you'd eaten all month. I thought those were great outcomes. And so um, I went for everything. And then I was on the board and I don't know if you guys have ever gone to a university board meeting, it's the governance of the university. I would argue that a third of the people who sits on boards of universities would feel that the university would operate much better if not for all the problems the students caused. Which is a very bizarre perspective to have while sitting on a board of a university. And so as a student representative, I always moved my name card away from those people and put it beside this guy named Terry Matthews who's an entrepreneur in the West End because he seemed to like students. And so that's kind of the, the, the fill it in on that. But when I think about... Um, how can I work with people? If you guys Google a guy named Michael Lee Chin, Michael is the uh, only person born in Jamaica who's a self-made billionaire. He lives in Canada, lives in Burlington. Um, he is an amazing person, and so uh, he and I got to know each other, and we have ridden around in cars, and we try to talk about, like, how come we could work together and talk together. And he's, like, unbelievable. He started off as the son of an orphan in, born out of wedlock in Jamaica 69 years ago. And now he's a multi-billionaire having set up global businesses, which is quite an accomplishment. There are not, you're not starting with massive advantages in that circumstance if you're him. And so the last time we were driving around together, we said, what can you look for if you're going to work with people? And we nailed it down to three things. One is energy. If you do not have energy, if you do not have enthusiasm, if you don't get up and try and make things happen, I can't work with you, he can't work with you, because um, a lot of this stuff takes energy. You gotta keep trying, you gotta keep going. We said, you have to have IQ, but you can't have too much IQ and you can't have too little IQ, because you would trouble yourself to say, who's the most annoying person that I've ever met? The super smartest one or the least smart one? I'd say nine times out of 10, the super smartest one actually wins the most annoying award. And so you want people who've got IQ, but not off the charts so that they become that troublesome character. And the final thing we looked at and said we agreed on was that they had to have integrity. And this is not the definition of integrity where you won't steal my money. It's the definition of integrity that you treat everyone you interact with in every quadrant of the business in a way that they would prefer to work with your company over everyone else. And so if you put the energy, the IQ, and the integrity together, that's the foundational elements of how you can actually have a durable relationship. And so when I think of a guy like Terry Matthews, in my books, he's like a 200-pound nine-year-old. The guy's got energy beyond belief. He runs around and works like a maniac, and he continues to create great things for Canada, despite the fact that 
he doesn't get rewarded equivalently to his effort or risk. And so that's the kind of stuff that I think over time is quite durable. Well, on that note, uh, that seems like a great place to end it. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time, uh, and uh, please, uh, please give Bruce a round of applause. And, and next year, I want to come back for that fucked up thing because I think I got a lot more laying down and talking to do. Thanks, guys. Yeah.